Cool. All right. <laughs> so, um, so I guess I will start with uh, my own introduction here. Um, so my name is Eric Nelson, and I live in Wisconsin. Um, I currently work for Slipstream, which is a nonprofit organization out of Madison. Um, they have a ton of projects and a ton of things going on, um, which I don't know everything about what goes on there. Um, but I work in the uh, training and technical assistance. Um, so I come from weatherization now. Um, I just a little background on where I come from. Um, I have been in what basically in the weatherization assistance program or working for that program for just over 16 years. Um, I started out at a local agency um, doing weatherization. So I started out as the retrofit installer. So I was the one getting in, getting in the attics, getting in the crawl spaces, doing all the all that stuff. Um, getting on, getting underneath the bellies of homes and uh, working in lots of uh, manufactured homes over the years. Um, so I was I was working on the homes and then eventually I kind of made my way up to supervisor and then I made my way to uh, energy auditing and then to final inspecting for the program. Um, and now with Slipstream, what I do is I do training for weatherization all around the, the state of Wisconsin and I also do um, state weatherization inspections. So I've seen a lot of homes, a lot of different situations. Um, I've, like I said, I worked on a ton, um, ton of manufactured homes uh, over my time here. So um, basically what I'm going to be talking about, and I don't know, let me see if I can, let me see if I can share my screen here one second. Let me get this up and running. So what I wanted to accomplish um, and why I'm here is to, to talk about weatherization. So um, I'm gonna go through a bunch of bunch of items that I did when I was out in the field. Now, all the things that I'm gonna mention are not necessarily weatherization assistant uh, protocol here in Wisconsin necessarily. This is basically just my experiences of what um, you can do as homeowners um, to help save some money, help save some energy, um, help your home to work a little more efficiently, uh, maybe a little be a little bit more comfortable. Um, we're going to talk about maintenance maintenance items as well. We can basically talk about anything while I'm going through this presentation. Um, it, it's really up to you. I, I do have a presentation um, that's going to gear around all these things. Um, for those of you, if, if you, we have anybody just calling in, um, the presentation that I have is basically just to keep me on track. I like to sidetrack and talk about all types of nerdy weatherization stuff. So um, it just helps me, helps me to keep on track. But a lot of the stuff that I have is just uh, pictures and examples of things that I'm talking about. Um, so let me see if I can share the screen here and let me know. I'm not too familiar with Zoom, so hopefully we're going to do this right here. And right now we don't have anyone that is phoning in. So everyone okay, should cool. be able to see your visuals. Perfect. I think, okay. Are you seeing, I think you're seeing my screen. We are. You, we see, got it. Yep. you are not? You are? Yeah, okay, are. cool. Okay, perfect. Okay, this is a nice little setup because I can kind of see what's going on too. I'm not super familiar with Zoom. Um, a lot of the stuff that I do is on Teams. So this is a nice little setup here. But so anyway, so I'll, I'll just kind of start with what I'm talking about here. So so I'm going to dive into weatherization, but by all means, if you have any questions about anything having to do with your home maintenance, anything like that, I mean, I've done a, a ton of stuff over the years. Um, I don't know everything. So if I don't have the answer for you, I'll sure um, give you give you my my best guess. Um, if I absolutely don't know anything about the subject, I will absolutely admit that immediately. <laughs> so um, so anyway, let's let's get started here. Um, I guess first. When we're talking about humidity, um, I, I wrote that down because that's one of the questions that was asked. And I think I will be able to hit on this a little bit better later and I don't wanna jump into it. So um, I, I will not forget about it. I think it's, I can maybe add it a little bit, a little bit later, but I will get to that. So um, let me see if I can get to, that. okay. So just overall about weatherization, just to give you a little bit of familiarity with kind of the things that I have been doing. Um, so weatherization is just adding retrofit materials to homes. So when I say retrofit, so you're adding new materials to homes to make them more energy efficient. So we're talking about insulation, we're talking about air sealing, 
Um, there's all kinds of tests. So when I started, when I started this job, a buddy of mine was like, Hey, you should come work for us. Uh, we install insulation in homes and we help lots of people, you know, and, um, and I was really interested in that at the time. And I don't know when I, when I started, we started, uh, I started digging into the building science part of it. And it's not just slinging insulation around. There's lots of things that you have to think about um, when you do weatherization, humidity being one of them. Um, so when you go into a house and you insulate and you air seal, um, there's lots of tests. There's lots of things that could maybe go wrong. If you tighten up a house too tight, so to speak, um, there's a possibility for other things to happen. Um, your natural drafting appliances might not work. Your humidity level might be too high. Um, so, I mean, it, it just kind of drew me in. So the basic rundown of the things that, that I have been involved with was energy auditing. So that is going into a house mm. with a bunch of equipment, um, testing to see how tight the house is. We're um, testing um, the furnace and the water heater for safety. So that would be diagnostic testing. We do lots of pressure testing. Um, we do um, all kinds of air sealing. So air sealing what I mean by air sealing is we're, we're basically just sealing up the house. So we're talking about like weather stripping and things like that. Um, the, most of the things that we do are in attic spaces and um, in basements or underneath um, manufactured home bellies. So we get underneath there, crawl underneath there and do all kinds of sealing and things like that. And I'll get it a, a little bit more into the uh, more that can be done underneath there. Um, but adding insulation to these areas, appliance upgrades, so heating systems, water heaters, uh, refrigerators, freezers, um, and then everything from light bulbs to water saving opportunities, um, installing exhaust fans for humidity. Um, and basically the process goes, an energy auditor comes in and, and checks out what's going on with the house. If the house is already fully insulated and it's all already fairly tight, maybe nothing needs to be done. Um, and that, that happens a lot of the time. Um, uh, so the energy auditor goes in and evaluates the home and he says, okay, well, you could use some insulation up here. You could use some things over here and all that goes into an electronic, uh, auditing system that says whether doing these things are, is going to be cost effective. So if we're going to be installing a bunch of insulation, there's gotta be some type of payback, right? It's gotta be worth it. Um, you probably, you're not going to hear me talk too much about windows today. Um, and the only reason why I bring that up is because windows are very expensive. Um, and a lot of people ask about windows because they see, you know, the window, the window guys on TV, they're always like, well, you'll save 40% on your uh, energy bills. If you get new windows, that's not necessarily true. Um, maybe in certain households it's possible. Um, but just for an example, I did an energy audit for a home, um, around my area. And they told me right when I got there that they spent $30,000 on windows. And when I went through and they said they didn't save a dime and they didn't know what was going on. So by the time I went through, I noticed they were short on insulation in their attic spaces. They had tons of areas where air sealing was an issue. So um, holes in the building shell all over the place. Um, and there was an add on in uh, the rear of the home that just wasn't connected very well. And there was all kinds of stuff that I was able to do as weatherization um, to help them out. And, and it costs a lot less than $30,000. Um, so so I, I just wanna bring that up because we're not gonna talk too much about windows. I will mention um, in the air sealing section, I suppose I'll, we can just talk about it now. Um, as far as windows are concerned, the best bet as far as um, keeping your windows sealed is plastic. So I am, I'm a big believer in plastic. I have, I have an older home that was built in 1950. A lot of the windows that I have are single pane wood windows. They're very leaky. Um, so, and I, I can't afford to, to replace my windows either. So I usually put plastic on, on, uh, the leakier windows every winter. And then I take the plastic off in the spring. Um, sometimes I just leave them on, um, year round. I mean, eventually they'll fall off, but I think if, if you're looking for a good, a good way to seal up windows, using plastic in the winter time is your best bet. Um, and it's definitely cheapest. Um, you can get um, in, in interior storms, which is something that is kind of a newer thing that's happening um, for manufactured homes. You can buy um, interior storms that have like plexiglass on them. Um, and that costs anywhere from, I don't know, $30 up, depending on how big the window is. Um, and that and that is something that I think that uh, that should be dug into a little bit too, because you can take those on and, and 
take them on and put them out or put them on, take them off those types of things in the winter. Um, so just as a warning, I'm not, that's probably as much window talk as you're going to get out of me. Um, the big ticket items are the things that I'm going to talk about. Um, insulation and air sealing being the two bigger of the, of the ticket items, I guess. Um, but just getting back to the process here, um, after the energy audit, then the weatherization crew comes in and gets all the work done. They do a lot of the testing, the safety testing. And then after that, a final inspection is done um, by a final inspector who just checks all the work and makes sure that everything is done up to program standards. Um, and that's just, just a quick little rundown. There's a lot of extra stuff that I could maybe talk about, but I think that's enough. Okay, so the two things I'm going to talk about today, which I kind of already brought up, so I'm going to I'm going to talk about some things that you as homeowners can do. Um, I am going to I'm going to talk a little bit about things that you can bring professionals in um, as far as insulating and air sealing and things like that. Um, depending on what you need done, it is very difficult to find people to work underneath manufactured homes. Um, I was even just looking around my my area, just kind of googling things to see if I could even find anybody that actually said we will we will work on manufactured homes underneath. Um, and I couldn't really find anything, so I don't know of anybody offhand. It's kind of regional, I guess. Some places have kind of Mister Fix It guys that work around town and stuff like that. Um, unfortunately, there's not any company that just specializes in that sort of thing, at least in my area. Um, but they could be in your area. Um, and I'll talk about the things that you can maybe dig into or ask people about. So if you are looking for any type of professional or somebody to come in and do some work for you, you'll at least know what you want done and how you want done. Do I, do I have any questions so far? Okay, absolutely chime in. This is totally laid back. I will absolutely sit here and ramble on. <laughs> so if you guys want, if you, if you want to, yeah, absolutely. I got a quick question. Yeah. Um, Again, you know, you're probably getting jumping the gun here, mm -hmm. uh, but what um, slipstream? What is what is your? Are you guys a non for profit? Yep. Okay. Uh, so, and what 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 percentage does the homeowner have to pay? Okay, so for for the weatherization assistance program, that's a national program. Um, every state has kind of their own their own local their own local setup. Um, so whether you're in Wisconsin, Illinois, Michigan, um, every state has their own um, their own program, but it's a national program. So for the program here in Wisconsin, as an example, um, in Wisconsin, the rules are if if you if you're on energy assistance, then you are eligible to have weatherization assistance on your home and you don't have to pay anything the only the only way that you would have to pay something is if you're a landlord if you're a landlord then you might have to pay a little bit out of pocket um but as far as having this work done it's it's all funded by the program itself so here in wisconsin we're actually really lucky here in wisconsin because some of the money that comes out of um public public benefits that actually goes into this program and a couple other programs so if if in wisconsin if you look on the very bottom of your of your energy bill there's a little thing that says public benefits and it's like one or two dollars or whatever a month um depending on how much your energy bills are and that just that dollar or two gets put into this big pot for the state and then that gets tallied up and that actually goes towards weatherization program it goes towards uh, a, a furnace program that replaces furnaces um, and there's a couple other smaller programs that it goes to as well. So everything is funded by the program itself. So you don't act, you don't have to pay anything. There's not a lien on your house. There's not anything that can be done. You don't have to pay anything after you move. It's absolutely nothing like that. Um, it's fully funded by the program if you actually get in the weatherization assistance program. And, and you would apply through the weatherization program or you would talk to what agency? Yeah, so there's local age, there's local agencies. So for example, I live in Oshkosh and when I Oshkosh, Wisconsin. So when I worked for my local agency, I worked for um, Advocap. So they covered three counties. So they covered Winnebago County, Green Lake County, and Final Act County. So um, but you would actually call who you get energy assistance from. And where you get energy assistance from, um, they're all over the place. It's all regional. Um, I don't I, I don't have like a list of places you can call depending on where you're at, um, but energy assistance is also um, that's also a national program as well. Each state has kind of their own rules and their own limitations and things like that. Um, so I only really know Wisconsin's because I'm from here and I've worked here. Um, 
but I know that it's a national program. And I, I don't know if you have to be on energy assistance to get into the program in Minnesota and Illinois. Who, do we have anybody here? We have people here from Minnesota, correct? Yeah. Do you mind if I chime in about this? Oh yeah, um, absolutely. So, you know, in, um, in Minnesota, you have to be, and I think like you said, in Wisconsin, you have to be on the energy assistance program in order to be eligible for the weatherization program. Mm -hmm. Um, one thing is, is if you've had weatherization work done, I think it's in the last 12 or 15 years that you're not eligible until that time period has lapsed. Mm -hmm. And then also some cap agencies are um, reticent to work in manufactured homes. So it's been a huge barrier for a lot of people yeah. in order to access the energy assistance program, mm -hmm. um, simply because um, a lot of cap agencies don't have the tools. So that's something that NCF is working with local cap agencies um, to connect them with Slipstream so that they can get the acumen as well as the, the know-how to be able to do it more effectively. So yeah, that's just absolutely. a little, um, for, for anyone um, that's looking to get connected to the program, connect with your TA provider and NCF can help you connect to the right cap agency and then um, direct you to the, through the whole, we can, we can help in the process. I know Natividad you know, we've worked in Anoka County and the cap agency there refuses to work in manufactured homes. So that's the frustrating part um, for, for Park Plaza, but for other communities, they've been a lot more um, willing to work in manufactured homes. I'm sorry, I'm gonna see myself. It's okay, it's okay. I have kids too. I'm telling them, to, I told them to be quiet before I started. We'll see how long it lasts. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a very good point. And uh, another thing I wanted, I also want to bring up here, in Wisconsin, as far as the weatherization assistance program, um, the rules have changed quite a bit over the last four years. Um, right now, if you have natural gas as your main um, fuel source, um, it's it's a completely different game. So there's like a tier system. So depending on how much you um, pay, uh, how much you pay for natural gas um, last year, so they'll look at. Um, how many therms you use. So that's basically how much how much natural gas that you used. Depending on how much you use, you're put into like what's called a tier bin. If you use, you know, X amount, you can get this amount of money put towards weatherization. If it's lower, then, then the amount gets lower. Um, but if, you're, if your home is fueled with um, uh, liquid propane or with, uh, with oil, which I haven't seen oil one yet, but you never know. Um, then you're available to have what's called full weatherization. So then, then they come in and they do um, all the diagnostics and they, they, they do a little bit more like what we used to with everybody. Um, but if you have natural gas, you're a little bit, a little bit, a little bit limited on what you're, we're able to do. Um, and those rules change all the time. So that's just kind of how it is right now. Um, is there any other questions about the program itself? Oh, as far as Slipstream is concerned, Slipstream does not do any of the work. So Slipstream is contracted uh, by the state of Wisconsin to do the training for weatherization and to do uh, the quality control inspections on homes that have already been weatherized. Um, so what I do is I go around the state and I teach a bunch of classes on how to weatherize homes, um, different acts, aspects of it. So I teach, I have a, I have, there's a class that I teach on how to read infrared cameras, there's a, a, an entire class that I teach on um, uh, working with asbestos and lead. There is another whole entire class on air sealing and um, air sealing and basic diagnostics. And there's all these other, I mean, I could go on. There's, there's a bunch of other classes that I'm gonna even be getting into. Um, one thing that I, that I didn't mention is I just, uh, I just started working with Slipstream this last November. So I've been, I have been training um, at my agency for years, but I just signed on to, to work with Slipstream. So that's, um, so that's even a little bit new to me, but doing these classes isn't, isn't very new because I have a ton of experience doing all this stuff. So, um, so that's, that's kind of where my expertise is coming from when, as I go through this, um, this presentation. I think Natividad has her hand raised. I do. Go ahead, dear. I think you're muted. There you Sorry. go. Sorry, <laughs> I was unmuted, darn it. Another <laughs> thing with Anoka County too is, and statewide is, it also um, doesn't always allow you if you make too much money. You could just be a few dollars over and they still will deny you. Plus it also matters whether or not you're um, legal or if you're an immigrant, you can't apply for that as well. So there's a lot of barriers in the state, which is unfortunate, and especially in Anoka County. Mm -hmm. So 
it's best to work with each county and find out what's available for your group. So I, we're, we're, our hands are pretty tied in Anoka, mm -hmm. which makes it difficult. So we're always looking for more information to try and get some help here. Yeah, absolutely. And it's very frustrating because every region is so different. Oh yeah, um, yeah, it's, it makes a big difference. Yeah, it's very frustrating. Um, so is there any more questions about that? Okay. All right, so that, let's dig in uh, to, to some stuff that you can do um, with your home or to your home. I'll, 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 let's just get started right here. Okay, so the first first section I'm going to talk about some DIY weatherization. Okay, so some of the uh, some of the line items that I had up there, we're going to talk about in a little bit more detail, um, and maybe even too much into detail depending on how I go here. <laughs> All right, so let's just start with uh, with water savings. Okay, so. I know a lot of people, um, some people don't necessarily like the water savings because they like a lot of water, um, especially in their showers and their kitchens. Um, but one of the one of the tried and true ways to save some water and, and to save a little bit of money is to add um, faucet aerators to your faucet. So I have an example here um, of what a faucet aerator is. Now this is kind of taken apart. So when they squeeze all together, it's just that little thing on the end of your faucet that you can take off. Um, so a lot of times, as far as weatherization standards are concerned, if, if there's anything over 2.0 gallons per minute, you can actually see it on the side um, of the faucet aerator. We usually um, give it an upgrade to 1.5. Now, in bathroom sinks, this is a great idea. In kitchen sinks, I'm not the biggest fan because especially if you're like me and you do not have a dishwasher, um, sitting there and waiting for that sink to fill up uh, can be annoying at times. So. Um, I would suggest maybe putting them in the bathroom um, and maybe getting a, sh a shower head that has uh, that saves you some water. So that's the 1.5 gallons per minute. Um, I don't notice the difference when I switched over to the to the the low flow shower head. They say you don't really lose pressure. It's just not as much water, um, but it does save you on a bunch of water. And I definitely recommend switching them over if you're able to. And they're really, really cheap. Uh, with the shower head, sometimes you can't find fancy ones that have have all the fancy little dials and you can change the settings and all that stuff. Um, but they're starting to come up with new ones. And I think the standard is actually going down that where it's going to be close to that 1.5 gallons per minute. Um, so saving on water, saving on your water heater, um, having to fire up so much when you're using water is always a good idea. Um, and another thing to think about too, um, they don't make these a lot that are um, compatible with the um, the portable dishwashers, those actually have a special separate um, adapter on the sinks. So if you have one of those, I wouldn't even bother looking into it. Um, but this is something that could save you on some water and it could save uh, your water heater from firing up so much so you'll save on fuel as well. If, you, um, if you're individually metered through XL Energy in Minnesota, there's often an insert in your bill and you can get like a little kit of things for free. You just have to sign up for it and it's a low flow shower head and the aerators and they um they tell you uh, they ask you how many you want and i've gotten them for my house and yeah they're great although i don't use it in the kitchen either <laughs> yes yes I, don't, I wouldn't recommend using it in the kitchen i mean you can but most people don't like it in the kitchen a lot of times the ones that i've seen installed they're just installed in bathrooms and that's absolutely fine you don't really notice it if you're not having to fill a sink and it doesn't take an extra 10 minutes to fill that fill that bad boy you know um and you might even do you get light bulbs with that too um i haven't looked at it in a while i mean i know that it comes with it um i think that you can get either the like the light bulb package or the water package or you mm -hmm. can get a um like window caulking kit so there you, you have go some choices yeah we have a hand raise over here. Um, we actually were able to get light bulbs from our city and they yeah. worked with XL Energy program. In fact, I brought them to Bev's uh, party and gave them away. I was able to get some extra ones and it's a whole kit. Cool. So you're able to do that too. If your city can connect with XL Energy and get those out, that'd be great. Excellent. Yeah, there is a lot of programs out there that'll, that'll um, 
help you get light bulbs and faucet aerators and things like that. I know here locally, uh, Home Energy Plus has a little program that they do, or if you call them up, they'll um, they'll actually give you like a, a a smart thermostat too, depending on what's going on. Um, but they give you light bulbs and water and stuff. So speaking of light bulbs, which is what I was going to talk about next, um, if you have um, changing your light bulbs does act absolutely save you money depending on what, what light bulbs you have. So if they have the older incandescent light bulbs, um, switching them over to LED light bulbs does it does save you a lot of money. It does save you a lot of energy. But there's things that I want to bring up that people don't really know. So when it comes to LEDs, so that stands for light emitting diode. Um, the old incandescent light bulbs, how they were rated was in watts. So, so when you're talking about watts, you're talking about how bright it is, right? So how the LEDs are rated, they're rated in lumens, which is kind of confusing. So this little chart, this little chart here just shows you, okay, if you have a 40 watt light bulb, um, that's equal to about 450 lumens. Okay. And so on and so forth, getting up to 150 watts equals about 2,600. So um, a lot of the times when you get an LED light bulb, it'll actually have like a converter on there that'll say, okay, this light bulb was 800 lumens, which equals about 60 watts. Um, but these are starting to be out there for kind of a while now. So some of those are starting to go away. Um, but just to let you know kind of how that whole setup is, um, if you have CFLs currently in your house, um, I don't recommend going out to buy some LEDs just to switch them out because you're not going to save as much money. I think you can just wait until your CFLs fail on you. And then the next time you have to go to Menards to get some uh, light bulbs, then just get yourself some LEDs. Um, but there's one more thing I want to talk about with these light bulbs because a lot of people don't like them. And I think that is because of Kelvin. So Kelvin basically means color so you're good there's going to be a kelvin rating on these led light bulbs and what that means if the lower the kelvin the the warmer the light so on this diagram here as an example down here we have 2400 kelvin that means more of a more of a yellow or orange type of light so this is this is the type of light that you want to have in say your living room or your bedroom where you want to relax where you want to where you want your brain just to kind of relax a little bit more. And if you get over on the other side, which is the 6,200 Kelvin, which that's more of the blue, the, the really bright white light, that is more meant for being alert, staying alert. Um, you'll see a lot of times in office spaces and things like that, um, you're gonna see the higher Kelvin lighting because they want people working. Whereas a lot of times when I get the LEDs, I'm usually over on this side, uh, usually over on the left-hand side. Um, with the warmer lights. So a lot of the times, um, especially in weatherization, we'd bring in, um, we'd bring in some light bulbs, but we would just bring the light bulbs that were given to us. So we didn't really have a choice. It's a little different now that people are realizing that, okay, people don't necessarily want that really bright blue light all over their house. I certainly, I certainly don't because I did actually have that type of light bulb in my living room. And I was always just like, all, all the time, it was just it's too much. Um, so something to think about if you do get the light bulbs, make sure that you get the right the right type of light um, for the right room. So like if you have an office space or something then that you work in, then maybe I would get the brighter, the brighter, uh, the more Kelvin. But in your living rooms, bedrooms, you're going to want something a little softer than that so you can relax. OK, does that make sense? It does. Thank you. OK, um, OK. Are CFLs a savings over incandescence? Yes. So if, so if you, if you, you can change from incandescent to either CFL or LED and you're going to get some savings. If you want the biggest savings uh, jumping from incandescence, I would go right to LED. Um, but you definitely will get some savings jumping from incandescence to CFLs. Um, the CFLs are a little older. There was lots of concern about those having mercury in them and how you would dispose of them. Um, I've hit my head on so many of those things in basements and stuff like that. They're not, exactly durable <laughs> but um but, so i think that was a big concern um but those concerns are not there with uh with the led bulbs and they don't use as they don't use as much electricity either so i think that's why there's there's a little bit more of a push with these now and they're a little they're a little more popular they used to be kind of expensive too um but i've noticed that over over the years now that they've been around, um, they're starting to be a lot more affordable. You can get them in big packs for really cheap. And it's just a matter of, then you have to pick out, okay, well, how bright do I want it to be? What color do I want it to be? 
it it ends up being a little bit of a mess but once you get used to looking at those packages and you know exactly what you want um it's not that big of a deal it's just that first step that will take a little bit of time so you might it might take some time to get used to them because they are a little different and one thing that i've noticed too is the the leds they flash really fast so it's, it's a diode that flashes super fast that you're not supposed to really even notice it but sometimes if something happens really fast in the house or something you can almost even notice it a little bit it's kind of weird um so they do take a little bit of time to get used to are they suitable for outdoor use yeah yeah you can get you can get outdoor floods you can they have all all kinds of different ones now that are really bright you can even get ones that i just bought some a couple of years ago um that actually don't they're not as bright they're more of a really yellow um but they do work outside and they do not attract bugs. So that is nice to have it by the back door. I had a really bright, really, really white CFL by my back door a couple summers ago. And uh, my wife went outside and she let all these bugs in because the light was on outside. So we were chasing around bugs all over the house. Um, but that doesn't happen with these. They'll actually say that they're, they're uh, I don't know if, I want to say bug safe, but it'll say um, that bugs aren't attracted to them and they are out there and they're not that expensive. They're not as bright as, as your standard floodlights though. Okay, anything else about light bulbs? This is a little off the energy saving, but um, I know right. some of you folks are, are um, plant people. So does that 6,200 Kelvin work as a grow light? Yeah, well, actually I don't, I don't know if it would work as a grow light because it's a different type of light. Um, I don't know too much about that. You might have to get the Google out for that one. <laughs> I don't grow too many plants because I have a black thumb. So I, I, I try, but I'm just not, I'm, I don't, I'm not very good at that sort of thing. <laughs> okay. All right. One, one other thing I do want to bring up, um, is these smart power strips. So these smart power strips work really good with like entertainment centers and things like that, where you have lots of electronics. So the thing that we're trying to avoid here um, is what's called phantom load. So when you have something plugged in, but it's but the appliance is actually off, but it's still drawing electricity, okay? So a lot of the, a lot of the newer appliances don't have that as much um, as years past. Um, but this, but this is the sort of thing that will that will help you avoid that. So what happens is um, you have this power strip. Can you guys see my little cursor or my my mouse thing on here? Yes. Maybe you can. Okay, you can. Okay, because I was wondering if I was circling stuff for no reason. Okay. So so this is the power strip, and this this blue first one is the controller outlet. So what happens with this spe specific example? is if you have something plugged into this blue then whenever you turn that appliance on everything in the green section here will will turn on with it meaning it's not it's not going to turn on it's going to get energized so as soon as you turn the appliance off that's in the blue then all of the power gets cut for all of these other outlets which is nice because then everything just doesn't have power and you're not you're not um you don't have any of that phantom load um, in this example, there's two outlets that are just always on. You won't always see that, um, but this specific one has has two outlets that are always on as well. Now, some of the newer appliances don't work very well with these things. Um, a lot of the newer appliances have lower wattages, so some of these won't actually pick that up. Um, so trying different ones uh, might be a little bit of a pain, but if you have a lot of things, like I have one on my entertainment center and I have, um, I have my television plugged into the blue one, so to speak. And then I have like my, my DVD player, my Blu-ray player plugged into the other one. So every time I turn my TV off, everything just gets shut down. So then, and it works, it works pretty good. Um, I ha I didn't, I haven't noticed a lot of, a lot of savings, but I could probably use these in a couple different rooms in my house. I just haven't gotten to it. So th this is an option for things where if you have a lot, a lot of things plugged in, like I said, entertainment centers, things like that. Um, these are good to kind of keep control of the electricity that you're using when you don't realize that you're losing it. Yeah, in Wisconsin, actually, Southeast Wisconsin, us, uh, we energy people. Mm -hmm. um, we have, they have a thing called Focus on Energy. Are mm -hmm. you familiar with that, Eric? 
Yeah. I, in fact, I just I got one of their packages where they sent me three three uh, LED bulbs, um, uh, a water 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 uh, pipe tape, um, and one of these um, uh, outlets. One mm -hmm. of these trips and uh, and a couple aerators. So you know, it's like, and they have like about four different types of packages you can get from them. So nice. But do I don't you know use the do you use the strip? I haven't I haven't plugged it in yet, but I'm I'm you know I'm I'm getting ready to. I'm mm -hmm. changing things out. Like you know, I still have like the old just you know plug it all in power strips. Mm -hmm. And I'm good. I, I've used these types in the past for my computers. You know, mm -hmm. so I will again be you know in in your very. Short, I just got these things. Like, it came really about maybe about four days ago. So. Mm -hmm. I think the only thing that people don't really like about these is when you have like a DVD player, or a Blu-ray player, or some type of other electronics, no matter what it is. A lot of times the newer ones, once you turn the power off and then you turn it back on, it takes time to load. And sometimes it's got to connect to Wi-Fi or whatever you got going on. So that's the that's the one thing that people don't like is because then they have to wait for it to, to start and do all those types of things. So I can totally understand um but it does it does save electricity and that's ultimately what, what we're looking for right so and it does take a little bit of a little bit of monkeying around to get them figured out because they're all a little bit different um but i definitely recommend trying them out especially if you have large entertainment centers uh with lots of appliances okay so i'm going to talk a little bit about uh heating systems so the number one thing you can do with your heating system, the number one thing is change the filter. Um, so many, so many furnaces I've inspected where people didn't even, maybe even didn't even know that they had filters. Um, so of course their heating system has a filter. Some of them are harder to get to than others, depending on what you have. So. Oh, well, the two right. examples that I have here, uh, a manufactured home. A oh, I'm, oh, sorry. I've got too many screens here. Okay, so um, the one on the left, the screen one here, uh, is a cleanable filter. Um, this is probably what, what you'll see a lot of the times um, in manufactured home furnaces. Um, these filters are fine. They don't really filter the air, though. So... You're breaking up, Eric. We're, we're freezing up one or the other. Uh oh. Yeah, Eric, if you can hear us, um, you're froze up. We can't hear you and you're not moving at all, so. When we're talking about furnace filters, I... am I back? <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. I guess uh, we got disconnected there for a second. Okay. Not sure how that happened, but we'll we'll uh, we'll keep her going here. Okay. All right, can everybody see see my stuff again here? Okay. <laughs> All right, sorry about that. I'm not sure I'm not sure what happened. Okay, so anyway. So the filter on the left doesn't really doesn't really filter air. Well, I mean it filters the air, but it doesn't take a lot out of the air. Um, so what I was talking about before was a MERV rating without getting too much into the business of it. Um, a MERV rating will be on all your furnace filters that you see. The lower the MERV rating, the less it will filter. Okay. So say you have allergies or, um, or you want to filter the air a bunch, then you want to get a higher MERV rating. Um, some, a filter like this on the left is only really meant to keep large objects and things out of the furnace. It's not necessarily meant to filter the air. Um, so depending on how, how you want to filter the air, um, you get a higher MERV rating. If you want a higher MERV rating, it's going to cost, it's going to cost more. Um, as an example, my son, uh, he has asthmatic symptoms sometimes. So I, I got a furnace filter that has a higher MERV rating so that I could get some of the dust and things out of the air because it helps them out. Um, is that so the example MERV. -E 
it's just a it's just a rating system um, that ASHRAE figured out. I think it was in 1987. Um, it's just a different way to rate um, how the filters work and what they actually filter. When you're looking at the filters when you're buying them, it'll say the MERV rating and then it'll say what exactly it filters. And that helps out a lot too. Um, so this example on the right, this is a this is MERV 6. So you can see it, it looks a little thicker um, and it's corrugated um, on the inside there too. It's kind of hard to see. Um, but that's going to filter a little bit more of the dust and a little bit more of the allergens out of the air. Um, one other thing to note, if you have a higher MERV rating, you should check your filters a little bit more often. Now, people always ask me, well, how, how much should I, how many times a year should I check my filter? And it all depends on what you're doing at the house. It depends on if you have, if you have pets, if you clean a lot, or if you don't clean a lot. Um, an interesting story, when I was doing an audit on a, a duplex some odd years ago, on, uh, it was a side-by-side -side duplex. It was um, on, uh, on one side of the building, um, there was a man that was in a wheelchair. He was, just, he was a special needs gentleman. Um, he, didn't, he couldn't really clean a lot because he couldn't get around. Um, and then on the, other, on the other side of the building, um, was an elderly lady that just she cleaned constantly like her house looked fantastic um, and she everything had to have its own spot and it was beautiful and when I went to do an inspection on their furnaces they both have the same furnace and both of their houses are the same size which one do you think had the dirtiest filter anyone the it was the side the clean lady it was the side with the clean lady because when because when she she vacuums and dusts and when you do that all sorts of dust and everything gets in the air and then all that dust goes through the furnace and then into the filter and the gentleman that didn't do lots of cleaning wasn't rustling a lot of things up in the air so his filter looked almost brand new um so it all depends on what you do what i usually tell people is when it comes to checking your filter check it every every two weeks once you check it every two weeks for a couple months, you can kind of gauge when they're going to, when they're going to start filling up. Um, and then just make sure that you replace it before it gets all clogged up, because if it gets clogged up, then it makes your furnace work harder and your furnace will not last as long. Things burn out, things get too hot um, in there. And that is the number one thing that I can tell you to make sure that your, that your, your, your furnace is up capped. Cause there's really not anything else that you can do as, as furnace owners, other than changing the filter. Um, you could get, um, get it serviced once, uh, once a year, or maybe once every two years, if you have a high efficiency furnace, um, like a furnace in the 90, 90 percent ish, um, you can probably get away with, um, with having it checked every two years. Um, if you have an older 80% furnace, um, then I would say maybe every year is probably a good idea. Here's an example of what happens if you don't have a filter at all. So the picture on the left is your, is your blower fan in your furnace. So now this is supposed to just look like a fan with fins and you can see it's all gummed up with dust and debris and all those kinds of things. So if you don't have a filter at all, this thing gets really gummed up and it can't push the air like it normally would. Um, and on the other hand, um, on this picture on the right is your A coil, with, which has to do with your AC. And you should be able to see all types of fins and things like that, but it's all covered in dust. So this, this AC coil is not being able, not working the way it should as well. Um, so just two really quick examples of what could happen if you don't use a filter at all. Um, that's another thing I would almost rather have you um, be a little bit late with checking the filter than not having a filter at all because then these types of things can happen and then your furnace will not last as long for sure question about uh, the merv uh yeah. ratings um again i i don't know about everybody else but you know i i my first was two years old you know mm -hmm. 90, 90 whatever percent you know yeah uh but it has the filter it has is the um you know the the you know, like the, the, the one on the left hand side where you got to Pop it just do a pop out sheet and you pop in a sheet. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's like you know, that that one that one on the left hand side. Mm -hmm. uh, what what are our options? We don't have like I remember when I was in a uh uh an actual home home, you know, it was a um, you know, slider filter in a side, slider filter out, or you could buy the electronic filters, you know, mm -hmm. all this. what are I mean, what are our options now for manufactured homes? Because we only have a certain type of furnace. 
Mm -hmm. Well, you can, well, both of these examples are um, a manufactured home furnace. So a lot of times they'll give you, when you get the furnace itself, they'll just give you a cleanable one um, because, because you can clean them out. I mean, you can rinse them off and clean them off and that's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with those filters, but it's just not gonna filter out as much of the dust. So um, as far as options, you can put whatever, you just have to, you have to figure out what size filter fits in this opening. And you can find a, a different type of filter with a higher MERV just at your local, your local Menards or any kind of hardware store that actually has furnace filters. It's just a matter of figuring out the right size because there's so many different sizes. And that's probably the biggest thing. You have to fit, you have to find one that fits the size of the opening. And that has to do, I mean, that has to do with any type of furnace. They all have such different, different sizes when it comes to filters. Um, so, I mean, you're not, you're not, you're definitely not limited. You probably can only, the only limitation I would say that you have is, uh, the higher MERV rating ones, like this example right here is only one inch thick. And I think the one inch thick is probably all that you're gonna be able to get away with if you have, uh, if you have a furnace like this, um, you won't be able to get the four inch thick ones. Those probably won't fit. And those have a really high MERV rating because they're corrugated like this and it filters all kinds of things. So I think that that's the only limitation you have is you can only have um, a one inch filter, a one inch thick filter instead of a four inch thick filter. That's probably the only limitation that you have. Otherwise it's just a matter of size and finding the right size. And how do you just, is it just the interior measurement of the opening or is there some um, mysterious formula for buying the right size? It's just the exterior, it's just the opening. So when we're measuring this, we're just, we're just measuring. So um, on the manufactured home, a lot of, a lot of the filth or a lot of the furnaces have, um, have fins or openings on the opposite side that let air in. So if you just measure how big that opening is, that's really all it is. You just got to cover it. I wish it was more magical. It's really not. <laughs> Okay, any other questions about filters? Oh, um, the only way you can check it, just look at it and see if it, if it looks like it's really dark. If it looks really dark or if it starts, if it's starting to bowl in, into the furnace, so like you put it in it straight and then it's kind of blowing into the furnace, then you know it's time to change it out. It's just a matter of looking at it. There's no special formula there either. Okay. Okay, water heater. Um, the only thing I could think of to help you extend the life on your water heater is empty the tank once a year. So there's a little, there's a little spigot kind of at the bottom of the water heater. What happens over time is a lot of the sediment and everything from the pipes and all that stuff kind of settle down at the bottom it, and it can, it can shorten the lifespan of your water heater. So I would say em empty it out, hook, hook up a hose right to the end of it and just open it up. Um, turn the water heater off first. I probably should have mentioned that first. Turn the water heater off and then you can just open that open that um, that spigot there and just let it drain until it's done and then close it and then you can fill it back up again. There should be a little there should be a little valve in here uh, with an intake pipe that you can that you can turn off to. It'll probably be your main uh, water source that comes in. Um, but emptying it out once a year is a good idea to get all that sediment out of there. Um, cause that sediment kind of, uh, it gets attached to the side of the tank and all those types of things. And it'll just extend the life of your water heater and your water heater will, will, will be more efficient too. It's not going to use as much gas if it doesn't have to heat up all that sediment too, to heat up the water. Um, another thing that I did want to mention if you have, um, in this example, so this is, uh, a manufactured home that has an outside access. If any of you have an outside access door, um, it would be a good idea to insulate your water heater pipes because that door is a lot of the times is not going to stop a lot of cold air. So the the water that you get to your sinks and to your showers and things like that are going to be a little bit cooler. So what happens, you end up turning up the water heater a little bit to get that water warmer. Um, but if you insulate, um, if you insulate all the pipes the best you can, um, that's a good way to that's a good way to save on your water heater working really hard as well um they're really cheap they're just there's pieces um they're just pieces of pipe wrap they call it just the black pipe wrap i probably should have put an example picture on here um but you can buy them for six foot pieces for like two bucks um 
on average, um, I would just measure uh, the thickness of the pipe. Usually it's half inch or three quarter inch. And then um, you want, just want to have a tight fit and then tape and then tape it on there. And that's really all you have to do to insulate them. Um, it's not super complicated, um, but trying to get those insulated if you can. If you have a water heater that's on the inside of the home and it's not by an exterior access, you don't have to worry about it. That pipe insulation is just that high density black. It looks yep. like a small pool noodle, right? Kind of. Yep, exactly. Yep, perfect. Perfect example. Yep, it's a small pool noodle and it's black. And then um, the biggest thing is just getting the right size because you want it to fit tight. You don't want there to be any, any kind of gaps in there or anything. So if you happen to get a, a piece that's too big, you can always just cut off, just take a scissors, scissors and just cut off a little bit, a little bit of a strip all the way up it. And then it'll just fit tight. And then you can just, you can just tape it. And about how much does the average water heater need? Is it something that you only need two feet of it? And so the community could get a bunch and lots of people could use some of it? Yeah, I would say um, to get the most savings, I would I would say insulate the water pipes uh, six feet out. So six feet out from the tank. Um, but be very careful too, because if you have a natural drafting water heater that runs on natural gas, so a lot of times they have that, uh, that metal pipe coming out the top. You don't want to get that, that insulation too close. So I would, I would say stay maybe three inches away from that pipe. So if, if, if you have that pipe right here and then you have the, the, the hot and the cold lines and they come out and kind of go wherever, maybe just start where it's a little bit further away from that metal pipe so that the insulation doesn't melt. Over time, it'll melt. It's not like a fire hazard or anything, but it just won't work as good. Any other questions about water pipes? Cool. Any other questions about anything else? All right. Okay, moving on. So um, another thing that I wanted to bring up was clothes dryers. So the clothes dryers, a lot of the time you'll see my example on the left here, you have the vinyl flex uh, venting coming out the back and it vents to the exterior. Okay. Um, Doing it like this and having it having it pinched up like this um, makes your makes your makes your clothes dryer work a little bit harder than it has to. Also, it'll take longer for your clothes to dry. Um, and sometimes in extreme situations, uh, lint can build up in this in this guy, and it can actually could actually potentially start a fire. Um, so I would recommend getting hard pipe and just and just venting it out with hard pipe. You can get it's usually four inch, so you can you can get um, four inch elbows and four inch ducting. Um, really, really cheap. It's not expensive. The only drawback to that, if you notice, the, the example on the left is really cool, close to the wall, and the example on the right is not very close to the wall. And you you can't put it very close to the wall if you use hard pipe. That's really the only drawback. A lot of times in manufactured homes, you don't have a lot of room. A lot of times it's in a hallway or something like that, or it's in a closet. So you might not have enough room to do a run like this, but sometimes you can squeeze it in just a little bit. I would definitely recommend doing this because your, your clothes dry will work a lot better and you definitely don't want to have any kind of a fire hazard. If you do have this vinyl, it's not the end of the world. I would definitely check it at least once a month to make sure that it's not getting clogged or getting too hot. Um, and make sure if it is getting clogged with lint that you vacuum it out and try to and maybe try to pull it out a little bit so it's not so squished back in there because um, that could potentially uh, be a serious issue down the road if, if not looked at, okay? All right, so, all right, air sealing. So this is a big one. This is one that I'm a, I'm a huge fan of. This is, we're gonna start getting into the humidity question that uh, was asked earlier too. Um, so as far as air sealing is concerned, now what we're trying to do with air sealing is we're trying, we're just sealing up penetrations where air can freely go outside the house. So a little bit on why we air seal and kind of the mechanics of how homes normally work. Um, it's what's called something I want to bring up called stack effect. Okay. I'm not going to get too hardcore into the science of things, but I do want to bring this up. Um, so in the winter, in the winter time, uh, it's a little bit more than in the summer. Uh, but in the winter, when we have really cold, dry air outside and we have really warm, moist air inside, um, there's lots of pressure differences. Okay. 
So how air is going to enter the home is going to be from the bottom. And then warm air rises, as we all know. And to replace that, the warm air goes out the top. So any kind of penetrations at the top and the bottom is air just moving. So as air moves in, comes in and goes out, all that nice warm air that you paid for with your hard-earned money is going outside. Now, some, some homes are a little bit more than others. Um, so I just wanted to, wanted to bring up that when, we, when we're talking about air sealing um, in a manufactured home, I want you to target the floor areas and the ceiling areas first. And I'll, I have a couple examples of things to look for here coming up. Um, but here's some other examples of things that we're going to be talking about or things that I want you to think about as, as we're kind of going through this. Um, any type of gross holes, we're going to talk about that. I have a couple examples. Um, cracks and seams in the ceiling, especially where the wall meets the ceiling. Um, any kind of broken glass. Um, you, can, you can weather strip doors. You can weather strip windows if you'd like to. Plastic on windows, we kind of already talked about. Um, so some of the stuff I, I have some pictures of. Um, sealing up underneath the belly, which is not necessarily something that I, I would uh, tell you as homeowners to do that's more something that a professional um, should go underneath and, and take care of um, there's a lot of things that could be going on down there and a lot of things that you need to think about um, so I would definitely recommend if, if you have any type of situation um, underneath the home or the belly is ripped away or you have some deterioration or if there was like a previous water leak or something and there needs to be any type of patching work done definitely um, have a professional to do that because there's lots of different things you have to think about when you're working on underneath there um, if it's something towards the exterior underneath there where you can just take the skirting up and it's it's just a hole right there then absolutely and i have a couple examples of some things to look for too um appliance venting penetrations are a little bit um can be a little bit more difficult <coughs> excuse me but i'll i'll go through all this i got some pictures so the first thing and probably the easiest thing for you as homeowners can do is sealing these seams so the example on the left is just where where the where the exterior wall meets the floor. Now there is carpet right here, which that gets a little bit dicey because it's really hard to seal when you have carpet. But there, it, it's kind of hard to see. But there's a big hole in the exterior wall right here. And patching that up with any type of rigid material, anything that stops air, it doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be lumber. It could be cardboard. It could be anything you want to use that's just going to stop air. Now. I know that you're probably saying, okay, well, there's, there's an insulation in my wall, so it shouldn't be a big deal, but insulation does not stop air. Insulation is purely meant um, to keep the surface area from getting cold. It has a lot of times insulation is fibrous, like fiberglass, um, and air will go right through it like a filter. So if fiberglass will act as a filter right here, but it's not gonna stop air. So you're still gonna have air coming in and out depending on wind conditions, how cold it is outside, things like that. So being able to seal it up with something that's rigid that won't have any type of air go through it is the best way to go. Um, if, if it's somewhere where you don't really care what it looks like, you just wanna patch it up, you could potentially use cardboard, you could use, um, you could use drywall, you could use paneling, anything that's gonna stop air that's not fibrous, okay? And this picture on the right up here, is where the ceiling meets the exterior wall. So you see that seam right there? A lot of times that seam is covered by some type of um, trim or some type of crown molding or something like that. A lot of times the reason why they put that trim and that molding up there is to cover that seam because it doesn't look nice, right? So even if you have trim up there, that doesn't necessarily mean that, that the air is being stopped. Because a lot of times when that, trim, when that trim is on, I can still see air leakage when I use my blower door, um, sh really, really short ab about the blower door. The blower door is a machine that I use that depressurizes the house. So it's just a big fan that I put in a door. It's got a frame and a big tarp and it's just got this big fan. So what I do is I turn it on and it shoots all the air from inside the house and it shoots it outside of the house. So in order to counteract that, um, all the air that's being pushed out air is being pushed in as well. So in the winter time, when it's really cold, 
and I have that big fan blowing, I can feel on cracks and crevices where all this air is coming from. And, and if there's air coming in when I'm blowing out air, that means when I don't have the blower door on, all, all that air is just going out. Um, so that's just the way that I can find air leaks. And usually in these areas, I find a ton of air leaks. So if you have um, that ceiling steam right there, even if you have molding or if you have, um, if you have any kind of trim or anything, just use caulk if it's bigger, if the gap is bigger than a quarter inch, I would say use some type of great stuff like can foams, uh, single can foam, stuff like that, because that, that gap is a little bit bigger. Um, but just using using caulk, if it's, if it's a small seam, that's really all you need. Um, one thing I will say about using certain types of caulk, if it's like acrylic caulk, um, that stuff, uh, does shrink over time after it dries so if you use acrylic caulk which is most of your paintable caulks that you're going to find um after you go over it and then it dries make sure you go back just to look because sometimes it can shrink up and then seams actually occur um so make sure that you go back to check afterwards to make sure that you have a good seal but these are two really big spots and super easy to get to um something that you can look for you definitely don't need Oh, I'm sorry, what? Rope caulking can work well for that too. I, I live in a really, yep. my house is 130 years old. So it's got lots of places where air comes in. Mm -hmm. And I just get that rope caulk that you can tear. It comes, looks like gray licorice. And then yeah. you take the strips off and, and kind of push it into crevices. Yeah, you can kind of push it in, yep. And you can also, if you have a really big gap up in that area, you can get what's called backer rod. It's basically the same material that we were talking about with that uh, with the water pipe insulation. It just comes in little tubes like that. They're just little, um, it's basically like the same, the same situation with that rope caulk. It's just a little bit thicker. So then you just take that stuff and you push it in the seam and then you can caulk over it. That way, if it's too big of a gap and you don't want to have can foam and stuff all over the place, you can just push that in there and then you caulk right over it. That way it makes the seam smaller and then uh, and then the caulk will cure. You can use caulk if it's over a quarter inch, but a lot of times it'll sag and gravity will take over and it'll actually come spilling out all over the place. Um, but these are two two of the bigger areas that I think that um, that U.S. homeowners would be able to see and be able to deal with that will, that will help you save um, a lot of your air from going from going outside. Um, another thing I want to talk about is gross holes. A lot of sometimes when I go into some homes, there there's maybe some water damage or there's a hole in the floor. And not only is it just you know it's a safety issue, but that's a lot of air. That's a lot of cold air that's coming up into the home, and it, it's also it's also pushing. So not not only is that air coming in, but it's it's pushing all the warm air out the top too. So. Um, whenever you have a big pressure difference like that, especially in the wintertime, you're probably not going to notice as much uh, in the summertime um, because the pressures aren't as, as, as different. But having something like this, a hole in the floor, um, even if it's a hole in the wall, something big like that, a lot of air goes runs through those areas. So patching that up, and like I said, it doesn't have to be pretty. Um, it, you just have to stop the air. Um, so that's one thing that I wanted to mention as well. Now, before you go around your house and you seal up every hole you see, I want you to think about this first. Some of these holes are meant to be there. These two examples, so the example on the left is underneath the sink. So this is, so this is where, um, where plumbing pipes are coming in, okay? The example on the right is underneath the tub. Now, there is holes in the floor around these areas. Um, be careful if you want to seal these because some of these depending on the type of home you have without getting too nitty-gritty into which one's good which one's bad um some of these holes are meant to be open so that pipes don't freeze um so be careful if you seal these areas you can give it a shot and try to seal them if you want to um a lot of the times i leave those areas alone or i could maybe just make the hole a little smaller um, but up, up here in, in the area that we live in, it gets really cold. And I definitely don't want to tell you to seal up these areas just to have your pipes freeze. So be very, be very careful when you're dealing with areas around pipes. So some of those holes are meant to be there to get a little bit of heat under, underneath by where the pipes are so that you don't have frozen pipes, okay? 
all those other areas I was talking about, absolutely seal them up. But these I would be a little bit more careful with. Okay, is there any questions about that? Does that make sense? Okay, perfect. All right. Um, here's a, a couple other common areas here. So these two pictures, the picture on the left and the picture on the right, these are where kitchen fans uh, went up into the ceiling. Um, a lot of times you see that like above, like a kitchen range fan and you can open up, uh, open up some cabinets above and you'll see it up there. There's usually a big fat gap right around where that fan vents up through your attic into your roof. A lot of times there's a big gap up there. That's, that's a real hot spot to air seal as well. Um, like I said, if it's a really big gap, um, get, getting yourself just a rigid material and then something to stick it up there to air seal it air sealing it with caulk or using some foam, um, you'll be saving a lot of energy in those areas too. And these holes do not need to be there. They were just cut so that the fan vent could go up through it. And a lot of times they just didn't care how big the gap was because it's, it's really not their concern. Um, but it's a, it's, it's a concern for us now that we live in the house and it gets really cold. So that's another hot spot to check out too. Um, air sealing, so, this is for venting. So these, this, this is a vent. So this, this is a direct vent water heater, which are very common um, in manufactured homes. So it's just your, your standard tank water heater, but underneath it, you, there's a little intake pipe where it gets its combustion air from. And then this is the pipe that goes up and goes right out the roof. So a lot of times you see gaps, big gaps right here. Um, you can, you can try to steal that. If you'd like, um, there's definitely a little bit more to think, out, think about with these. You have to use high temp materials. So when I'm talking about high temp materials, I'm talking about using metal and I'm talking about using um, high temp caulk. Okay, like uh, the lowest rating I would recommend would be a rating called uh, ASTME 136. You don't have to write that down. Um, it just has to be has to be high temp. So this this pipe right here will probably maybe get up to like 300 degrees, maybe a little bit more than that. So something to think about. You don't want to put foam or regular caulk up here because it'll melt and it won't last long. Um, I would suggest maybe calling a professional in, like an HVAC guy, to come in to seal that up for you, because you got to kind of think about it a little bit more. Um, just i just wanted to bring it up because you don't want to use regular materials on this it would have to be high temp stuff okay and that goes for your furnace as well um your furnace this is just kind of an example of what what they would do so you'd use so you have that big penetration you have the metal that gets tacked up there and then they would seal the metal so that's just kind of how it looks like um but this this also goes if you have a low efficiency furnace now this pipe up here, that gets really hot. That could potentially get up to like 400 degrees or so. So this stuff gets super hot. So um, I would maybe call in a professional to do, to do something like this, unless you're privy to that sort of thing and you know high temp caulk, if that's the case, absolutely. Um, but just be a little bit more careful with these areas because you, you don't wanna put a bunch of foam up there because it's not rated for that type of, for that type of uh, task, okay? All right, and then uh, another thing I wanted to bring up, if you do have the exterior, uh, the exterior closets um, for the water heaters, getting weather stripping on that door is, all, is always a good idea. If you can get some can foam or some air sealants in, it's really hard to seal a lot of this stuff. So, um, but anything that you can get to to seal any of these seams inside this closet is always a good idea. Um, but the biggest thing is maybe just to air seal um, the door um, when the door is on, this specific uh, example, they took the door off to put a new door on. Um, but if you have a door, getting some weather stripping on it will help quite a bit. Um, I just wanted to touch on that real quick. I, all right. So, all right. Before we get into this other stuff here, all right. So, I'm going to hit up the humidity question. So, humidity. Now, humidity is. Let's see, everybody reacts to humidity very differently um, as far as your body and how it makes you feel, right? So I personally, I react 
I, I'm like hypersensitive to humidity. I can't stand it when it's too humid in my house. My wife doesn't care. She can't tell. She, she likes it a little bit warm. So everybody's a little bit different. We always fight over to the thermostat. We don't need any of that. Um, so anyway, uh, but as far as humidity is concerned, you have to be careful. So one of the things that we think about in weatherization is when we come into a house and we air seal the house as much as possible to save as much energy as possible, what we're also doing is we're also um, we're also stopping the moisture from leaving the house. Okay, in the winter, it's dry and cold outside, so the humidity is going to be inside your house. So I don't know if any of you have issues with condensation on your windows. If you have condensation on your windows, that's not that's not something saying that something is wrong with your window. Your win there's nothing wrong with your window. Your window is actually working. If, if your window didn't have any condensation on it, then all that moisture would go right through it, right? So if you have a high high humidity level in your house and you're having condensation on your window, um, that means that you're keeping the humidity in. If you air, if, I don't think that um, you necessarily have to worry about it with air sealing just by the things I'm telling you to air seal, um, but through weatherization, it's possible to, to air seal too much so that there's too much built up condensation in the house and that can create mold and moisture and things like that, that you don't want to mess around with. Um, so I would say if, if I think it's, it's said that around 50%, um, 50% humidity is pretty good. Maybe even a little high. Um, it, for me, it's all about personal preference and you being comfortable. Now, if it's in the winter and you have the humidifier and you're getting all this built up, moisture on the windows or you see moisture on the walls or you see moisture anywhere else uh, on the exterior walls things like that um, then I would maybe be careful about putting too much humidity in the air because if if you're missing insulation or you're missing air sealing in certain areas um, the humidity is gonna is gonna attach itself to the coldest spot in the house I've seen houses that had that were fully insulated but didn't have uh, one certain section of the first floor that didn't have any insulation in the walls. And you could tell where it was just by looking at it because it was all dirty. So what happens is, uh, is the moisture attaches to the cold spot and then it builds up and over time the dust will hit it and you can kind of see that it's just, it gets dirty over time. Now <clears throat> that's not a big deal, but if it's too, if there's too much moisture on walls, especially um, on interior walls, like with paneling or drywall or anything like that, um, those are very, very good and rich uh, feeding grounds for mold. So if you have a lot of moisture on the walls, like visible moisture, you could potentially have a, have a mold issue down the road. I don't want to mention the, the M word and get everybody else scared. Um, but when we talk about humidity, um, and adding moisture to the air, especially in the winter time, um, when you have all these surfaces that are on the exterior that could potentially be cold, it's something that I want you to think about. Um, there's definitely no rule of thumb with how much humidity is good for you or bad for you, because like I said, everybody's a little bit different. I think as long as you're keeping, as long as you're paying attention to your windows to make sure that your windows aren't uh, getting a buildup of moisture, or if you're paying attention to your exterior walls or your ceilings, especially in corners, because moisture likes to kind of settle in the corners and things. Um, as long as you're paying attention to what's happening with your house and you're not having any kind of moisture problems on surfaces, I think you're fine. I mean, it, it's completely up to you. Um, there's places that can come in to assess um, if you do have mold issues and things like that. Um, the mold, to me personally, mold isn't as big of a deal as I think people make it out to be because there's easy ways to uh, to combat that. So for example, if you do have a lot of condensation on your windows, you could just wipe it off every day if that's what you want to do. Or you could turn on a bath fan or your kitchen fan. And as long as that fan is venting to the outside, I don't care if the fan is on the opposite side of where, where the moisture is, it's going to it's that fan is going to pull the air, the, the moist air from inside and it's going to push it outside. And then conversely, like the blower door that I was talking about, when you're taking air from the inside and you're forcing it outside, it's going to force that dry air from outside to come in and it'll kind of even itself out. 
I always have issues in the winter time with my living room windows because they're very old and they're only one pane. Um, so when we're cooking a lot and we have some noodles going or some rice going or something, there's always moisture on the windows in the living room. And all I do is turn my kitchen fan on and no more than 15 minutes later, the moisture has gone off the windows. Um, so if you feel like you're having an uh, issue with moisture, I would turn on any type of exhaust fan that you have. Um, just make sure that that exhaust fan is actually running outside and it doesn't like it doesn't go in your attic space or terminate in your attic space because it, that could actually be very bad because then you're just feeding all kinds of moisture in a very cold area um, and that that could lead to, to other things. Um, so I, I hope that was a very long answer to your community question. <laughs> I hope I answered your question. Did I answer your question? I want to chime in, Eric, and just do yeah. a time time check because we're at about twenty past seven. Okay. So okay, that's fine. Ten minutes. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions about humidity? Now that I talked way too long about it. <laughs> okay, I told you I can I can go off. Okay. All right. I only have a couple more things. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Bev. Um, my house is super insulated and really tight. Perfect. And I do add humidity and I had a new door installed and I had some mold form between the storm door and the interior door. Okay. Uh, on the upper part. And so I guess I have some leakage there. Maybe a little bit. Yeah. Um, if it's in between the storm and the exterior door, that's not as bad because what's happening is that there's just some air kind of moving, moving through those areas. Mm -hmm. um, it's not the end of the world. Um, if you want to clean it up, you can clean it up with just regular soap, things like that. Yeah, a lot of the times people have allergic reactions to mold, but um, but you want to know who does as far as mold, uh, mold and uh, health issues. Um, do you want to know who actually does the most research on mold and sicknesses is actually veterinarians. Because dogs lick mold and eat the mold off floors and things like that. And humans don't really do that. So um, it, it's very uncommon to get really sick from mold unless you have an allergic reaction to it. Now, there are types of mold that can get into the air that can be very serious and, and can, cause, can cause harm. But little spots of mold um, is not really that big of a deal. If you have like a really large issue, if there's a lot of mold everywhere, that's definitely a, a situation. Um, but if you have just a little bit between your storm door and your, and your exterior door, that's totally fine. Um, I would maybe add some weather stripping. Uh, you can get uh, the weather stripping foam that just kind of attacks on. You could get some weather stripping around the door. Um, that might help out a little bit. Mm -hmm. If you do have a very tight house, mm -hmm. um, just be careful with how much um, moisture that you put into the air because when you have a tight house, like I said before, that moisture doesn't have anywhere to go. Mm -hmm. um, so as long as you're comfortable and you, and you keep an eye on the things that I talked about, you should be fine. Okay, thank you. Appreciate yeah, no it. problem, no problem. Okay, um, the majority of the stuff that I have left over um, is a lot of professional stuff. Um, so we I just want to talk about um, uh, belly repair, so getting underneath. So um, in this example on the left, uh, you see a couple gentlemen underneath there with some Tyvek suits on working away. Um, that was just an example of you should probably call in to have somebody do, um, do work underneath there. The photo on the right is just a, um, a section of belly that was just missing, it was just gone. Um, and a lot of times if, if you have issues underneath the belly or it's missing or there's holes, you're not really gonna know about it. Um, there was one I came, there was one I was doing an audit on that he had a, uh, a tub leak and he had uh, mesh plastic uh, belly material. So all of that, all of that water from the tub just leaked underneath there and it just made like a, like a humongous waterbed looking type bubble underneath there. Um, so it's not the worst idea in the world to check underneath your mobile home every now and again, um, just to make sure that there's no critters or anything going on and to see what kind of belly repair you do need if you need any at all. Uh, you might not need any at all, which, which is, um, it's about 50-50 usually I, I find, um, but just check underneath there and then I would call somebody else in um, if you do need repairs. And then this is just just some pat just some examples of some patching. A lot of times they'll use house wrap. Um, there's different types of insulation that you can use, um, but like I said, it's not something that you would be able to do yourself. So you recommend just taking off a section of skirting, maybe on a yeah. couple 
spots around the house and shining a flashlight under there to see if it looks yep. like it's intact. Yep, absolutely. All right, and since we're running it on on time, I'm glad that I got to this section. So this is, so other than air sealing, this is another, another big thing that I really want you to think about. So we're talking about duct sealing. So this is the duct work that runs from your furnace to the rest of your home. So um, having these sealed up is great. Um, a lot of times, well, er almost every time, all the duct work will run underneath the home. And like I said, if you have any critters or anything going on underneath there, they could potentially poke holes in these things. And sometimes the ductwork can fall apart. Um, so any kind of penetration in that ductwork, you're just feeding warm air to the outside. So having this stuff as sealed up as possible is always a good idea and probably the most cost-effective thing you can do to your, do your manufactured home. Um, so this is just uh, the most common uh, runs, I guess, of ductwork. So if you know where your furnace is, this is the most common for, uh, for single wides. Um, for the, so if you have a furnace that's right in the middle, it's just going to have two pieces of ductwork jetting out uh, from one side to the other. It's usually a straight run. Sometimes if you have a, if you have a double wide, there's going to be a little connector to a second, a second run that goes on the other side. Um, so that can be a little bit more difficult because there's a lot more ductwork to check. Um, if you're to really dig deep into the ductwork, um, I would definitely have a professional come out and check it out. But I do have a couple things that you can look at. Um, as homeowners that I think are, are good. Uh, for one thing, this example on the left, this is a rug that was duct taped over the top of a heat vent that somebody put because they didn't like it underneath the table. Just an example of make sure that you have your heat vents open. Um, and, and this example on the right, I mean, these heat vents are on the floor, so they're gonna get beat up over time. Making sure that that the, the heat flow is nice and wide open in this example, um, it's been stomped on pretty good. So there's not as much heat flow coming up. Um, so that's gonna add a lot of pressure to other areas. So the heat is not gonna be balanced throughout the home. Um, so making sure that you maybe replace those every now and again, if they are beat up is a good idea. And then I have this, this is from a return that was in a manufactured home. Now returns aren't, um, they're, they're not very common in manufactured homes. A lot of times you have a central return, um, but this is just an example to, to take off um, your venting just to get to make sure they're cleaned out. Um, this is an extreme case where there's quite a bit of buildup. So the, the picture on the right is what happened after we took this off. Um, there was quite a bit in there that could be cleaned up. Um, so every now and again, uh, take your vent covers off to make sure that those vents are clean, um, to make sure that everything is, is flowing smoothly. Can you just vacuum is, those? Yeah, yeah, you can just vacuum it. It's just dust, that's all it is. And then here are some examples of some ductwork um, that was underneath a manufactured home. The, uh, the example on the left, um, mice got in the ductwork. So you can see the little holes. And then the example on the right, this, this one just completely fell apart underneath. So. Um, when the heating system turns on, all that air is just blowing right underneath. So you're you're basically just tossing all that warm air outside. Um, so something, another thing to check for when you're looking looking underneath your home. Um, these are uh, one way that you can find out that you can do is if you take a mirror, if you take a small mirror and just put it down in your ductwork, you can look down the runs and you can look for penetrations. This is this is just your standard metal ductwork. Um, on the left and then on the right, um, some manufactured homes have fiberglass ductwork. Now this stuff is fairly brittle. It's not as durable as the metal. And a lot of the times they just cut holes and then put metal, uh, metal joints in there. And those things are very common to fall apart because this material is not very durable. Um, so if you put a mirror in, inside your vent and you can look down and you can look for large penetrations so that you can at least see um, where these penetrations are. Um, and But something that you can do is you can seal up the registers right at the floor. So you can see whatever seams that you can see right at the floor, you, you can seal up yourself. Now, the material that I would like you to use um, for ductwork is a material called mastic. You can buy it at, at your hardware store. It's some, some call it duct mastic, but it's, it's a it's a sealing material that's meant for ductwork. So it's meant to go on metal. 
Um, it's meant to to seal up ductwork. So that's what it's for. Um, so what you do is this is a the picture on the left is just a picture that's right underneath this vent. So a lot of times when they put the vents in, they just take pieces of metal and then they they crimp them and fold them so they're not sealed up. Um, there's little seams in here where you're losing where you're losing small amounts of air. But if you air seal all the ones that you have, you're going to be saving saving on a bunch of air that's going outside. Um, so get yourself a plastic glove or you can get a uh, mastic in a tube form like a caulk and just just fill those seams up and you can just you can just lap it on because this stuff is really durable and it dries pretty quick um, and it'll seal things up a lot of times you'll have gaps on the top here where the where the vent goes up into the floor sometimes there's a gap um, and you can use uh, you can use mastic on that too. You can get mastic tape as well. That stuff's a little more expensive. If you just get the mastic in a pail uh, or in a cock gun, um, then that stuff that stuff will work a lot better for you. Is it smelly? Is it something that you should do this time of year when you can have the windows open or isn't it too you bad? Can. Um, the VOCs are pretty low on that. Uh, the volatile, I forget what that's called. I shouldn't even say that. Um, but yeah, as far as off gassing, it's not, it's not that bad. So it's not like uh, your silicone cocks or anything like that. There is an odor to it, but it's not, it's not harmful. It's not anything crazy. You don't need to ventilate the area. Um, depending on what you use, I shouldn't say that. I would all, always uh, read the manufacturer specs on, on the product because some of them are a little bit different. But the ones that I've used, you haven't had to do anything with it. It didn't call for ventilation or anything like that. Um, and this is just another example. So the, the, the picture on the left here is just some open seams underneath. So what they did was they took mastic tape around this seam here, and then they just cover the rest of it in mastic. So this is the fiberglass material right here. Um, so then they just put the mastic right over all the seams and almost even painted it so that all the seams were covered and sealed up. And that's going to save a bunch because now you're not going to be tossing all kinds of air outside in the winter time. Okay. Uh, Eric, now, Eric, before um, because we run out of time real quick here. Um, yeah. uh, uh, regarding vents for the uh, uh, skirting skirting vents on the exterior. Mm -hmm. Now they have some that are, are um, uh, that you can know, be open and closed. And are they worth are, are those worth the investment? No, I don't think so. Um, skirting is mainly meant to keep critters out and things like that. As far as saving energy, um, getting, because I know they sell um, some skirting that has insulation on them and stuff. And unless you have like a finished basement or you, you do things down there, which you probably won't. I mean, you're going to stop a little bit of the wind, um, but your air barrier is going to be right, right underneath the floor. So I, I don't, I don't recommend getting any kind of special extra um, super power skirting because it's really not going to do much for you and it's kind of expensive. Um, like I said, really that stuff is just meant to keep uh, keep critters from from going and making. I'm not referring energy. to skirting. I'm referring to the the vents that are that are uh, you know every four feet in the skirting. They, um, mm -hmm. You know, like they're just like you know uh, uh, the regular like your air vents type of thing. I mean, yeah. they have them where you can, you know, they have them automatically they can close in the wintertime, open in the summertime. And yeah, yeah, I don't think I don't think that um, opening those at all is a good idea because even if you open them in the in the in the summer, you're letting in a lot of moisture. So that's what I was talking about. So what happens going back to the stack stack effect? Air is going to go in those, and it's going to bring that the warm moist summer air underneath there, and there's not going to be anywhere for that moisture to go but in the house. And anytime you run moisture through through building components um, and makes things moist, it makes things less durable. Um, so I would recommend just closing them all the time. That's kind of the same thing. Uh, there's some uh, site built homes that have crawl spaces that have those vents. Um, and we, and I close them all off. I would I would never open those. They used to, it would used to believe that uh, you'd get rid of moisture by opening those up, but it actually makes it worse. And the, so this, so this last one, this is the last one we'll talk about. We're at the end here, but um, this is what it looks like if, if you actually have open spots underneath your home and you can actually get to the ductwork if it's somewhere that you can't get to from sealing up top. Um, but that would be something that out that uh, you should have a professional come and do. And I think these last couple slides were just um, adding attic insulation, which I think you should have somebody come in and do. They usually drill holes on the inside. Um, 
in the ceiling and then fill it with insulation. And then uh, the same as the floor. Uh, this example, they go in from the, from the sides and actually tube it in. Um, but a lot of times if you have somebody um, add insulation underneath your floor, they're gonna go underneath and just cut holes in the belly and, and insulate it that way. Um, but those are things that you should definitely have a professional come and do. And that's all I had. And I'm running out of daylight here. I'm getting dark over here. That was a lot of stuff. I tried to fit as much stuff as I could without getting too crazy, but. I thought it was great. Does anybody have any questions before we, uh, before we end here? Uh, how, do you feel, how do you feel about uh, changing out old refrigerators as well? Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah, if you look, if you look on your refrigerator, if it's, if it's older than uh, 2003, it's a good idea to get a new one because right around 2003, they started thinking about um, energy savings and they started um, using different motors and things like that. So um, if your refrigerator is older than 2003, you should definitely, um, you would save a bunch of energy getting an, up, getting an upgrade. I think that's one thing we can do through Anoka County is change yeah. out our refrigerator. Um, and then XL Energy usually will give you a $50 rebate if it's still working. So. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, take advantage of that for sure. If it's older than 2003, you're gonna save, you're gonna save some. If it's any older than that, you might not save as much, but um, it's still worth a look. Oh, it's not that old. Uh, Jim bought one from for about six million years ago. I think we're pretty good. Cool. That was a lot of information in an hour and a half. Nope. <laughs> Guilty. Not a problem. It makes me want to go home now, and I wish I had three more hours of daylight. I know, right? You're going to go home and look for uh, seams and all kinds of stuff. Hopefully. Well, my house is sinking, so now for the first time in all the years I've lived in it, 24 years, it, the ceiling is starting to bow in yeah. the kitchen. So yeah. And that'll yeah. open up that'll open up some seams too that wouldn't normally be there. Yes. So definitely, definitely check that out. Oh yeah. It's happening already. So well thank you, thank you so much, Eric. Yeah, that, sure. That was just great.